Live from London, England, it's theCUBE. Covering .next Conference Europe 2018. Brought to you by Nutanix. Hi, and welcome back. I'm with you, Piscar, and I'm Stu Miniman, and welcome to the CTO segment at Nutanix Next uh, 2018. Welcome back to the program. Uh, to my right is Benny Gill, who's the CTO of Cloud Services, and to his right is Rajiv Mirjani, not Biryani. Mirjani. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the CTO of, of, of Cloud Platforms. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks, Stu, for having us. Great uh, being back. All right, uh, Rajiv and Benny, uh, Nutanix has been kind of busy uh, since last time we've chatted. Uh, uh, AOS got really a file system rewrite. Uh, uh -huh. There's been some M&A integration going on as well as organic uh, activity. So, you know, I, I love to talk with the CTOs. Just if you can bring us inside a little bit, you know, what's been happening, what your team's been working on, some of the, some of the hard challenges. I mean, things like AHV nested hypervisor on top of GCP. You know, these are some hard challenges. Getting ready for NVMe over Fabric. You know, so some real, you know, massive things that happen underneath the cover, as well as some new products. So, uh, Vinny, want, want to start with you as to, yeah. you know, what, what's um, been keeping you your team busy? Oh, the teams have been quite busy, especially, you know, once you have, you know, more than 10,000 customers and uh, a product uh, that's earning a lot of revenue coming in, and at the same time, you have to change uh, the guts of it, preparing for the next generation. So it's a lot of work. I mean, if you're starting from scratch, it's much easier. Um, but the you know, we've had a lot of experience uh, bringing in new capabilities, making it transparent to the customer. One click upgrade is really important for us. So, learning from the past, we've been able to rewrite the engine for the storage in a way that customers wouldn't notice, uh, but it's going to run just faster. Um, you know, kudos to the team that uh, they pulled it off. Um, and it goes across the board when we are uh, acquiring new companies that come into the fold of the Nutanix family. Uh, the whole uh, idea is to make it look seamless to the customer because that's one thing that you know customers know us uh, for. Like, hey, is does, will it have Nutanix simplicity? Um, so a lot of learnings. Uh, we have uh, created some thumb rules uh, to guide people coming in, and uh, those are working fine for us. Yeah, and there's you know a method to the madness over here. There is in the end one vision that we want to provide a true hybrid cloud experience to our users. And to do that, we feel we have to first start by building the best private cloud. You can't have hybrid without private. And to do that, we need to have an infrastructure that actually works for private cloud. So we start with HCI as the initial platform. We build on top of that with private cloud features. And not just you know, networking, compute, and uh, uh, storage like in the past, but more platform services like ERA and uh, Carbon and so on. And then once we have that, we can then layer on the new hybrid cloud services. So even though it looks like we're doing a lot of things, it's all guided by that one vision. So tell me, um, you know, that hybrid, that hybrid cloud vision. You know, where does it lead us? Does it lead us to, you know, the public cloud in the end? Does it lead us to a Nutanix cloud? Where, where does it help customers go towards? Well, the way I look at it is that it doesn't lead to any one place. It leads to multiple clouds. Uh, there'll be private clouds, there'll be edge clouds, distributed clouds, big central public clouds. The important thing is can you move applications and data between, uh, between clouds. An analogy I use is, you know, 20 years ago, if you, if you were writing applications for Solaris, you were pretty much locked into Sun. If you were buy, writing applications for HP UX, you were pretty much locked into, uh, in, into HP. Yeah. Once Linux came along and made it possible to write applications for any x86 server, you went got independence from, uh, uh, from, from underlying hardware. And the same thing will happen with cloud. Today you have to write applications for Amazon, for GCP, for Azure. Who can build an operating system that actually commoditizes all that, that makes it possible for you to run on any cloud with the same set of applications. So that yeah. kind of sounds to me like you're you know, doing vMotion and HA and DRS, but then you know, for a new generation of technologies. Well, not. VMotion uh, for across clouds is of course uh, the goal, it is the goal, but it's not just enough to move the applications around, right? You have to move data around, you have to move, uh, the management plane has to be the same. So there's a lot more to it than just simply copying bytes across. And Pini, you want to add to it? Yeah, I mean basically, um, adding to what uh, Rajiv said, uh, if you ask where will hybrid cloud lead, I think it leads to uh, a dispersed cloud, you know, some of it was also mentioned by Deeraj in the keynote, which is, you know, this 
big monolithic cloud concept has to atomize into much smaller pieces and distribute. Yeah. And uh, that's what's going to happen. Well, you start with solving it with a hybrid, and at least solve it with two, and from two you go to many, and that's what's uh, really exciting. Yeah, it's a really good point, Vinny. I want you to help expand on that a little. I, I think back to companies that built portfolios, and you'd look at it and say, okay, well I, I buy product A, B, and C, and boy, I, I, I don't know how to use those together because they have yeah, different interfaces yeah, yeah. and how do I work them together. Today, you know, I, I think microservices architecture, I think about APIs pulling everything together. What are those guiding principles that you give internally to teams to make sure that I can use the pieces that I want, they work all together, they work with you know, this really broad ecosystem you have and all the right. multi-cloud yeah. environments. So, um, you know, as much effort we put in uh, building architecture for the product design, I mean, we have to put the same amount in terms of how is it going to be consumed by the customer. Uh, you know, just having a port long portfolio is no longer what customers are looking for, they're looking for simplicity, so to your point, um, one of the things we are really careful about is, um, especially when we're acquiring um, technology uh, inorganically, is how do you make sure identity and billing is, is the same, right? That's the most important thing. Uh, so you don't have to log in once in this product, once in that product, basic stuff, but if you get it you know, right, it's just delightful. And the other thing is about experience, developer experience and user experience. These are the, these are the uh, two other uh, out of the four factors uh, user experience is around, like do I have to learn this again? Like if, if you look at companies like Apple, I mean if I use the Mac, use, they try to make it very similar, uh, such that even a two year old can figure out how to use it and we would like to say that if you've been in IT industry for two years, you should be able to use any Nutanix product. Uh, developer experience is around APIs. Uh, we have a standard uh, that we have geared, um, uh, version three intentful APIs. And that is uh, creating a, a, a standardization across rolling it out. Yeah. yeah. You saw a little yeah. bit of, the of it in the demo today where you know, I went through Calm and Epoch and Flow and uh, Prism Pro all from one pane of glass. It didn't look like four different products. In fact, if I not mentioned there were four different products, it probably wouldn't have been obvious that they were. And that's important to us, keeping that yeah experience seamless is very important. Yeah, and that comes at a cost. I mean, it's uh, we could have released it uh, as soon as we acquired some of these things and punted it on to the customer to figure out how these pieces come together. Uh, but we know our customers have a higher uh, expectation from us, so we take the time. Yeah, and from, from that perspective, you know, as a, as a user, you know, I'm used to working with different types of clouds, public, private, hybrid, anything in between. And the amount of interfaces I have to touch to get you know something working, yeah. to get a uh, you know a series of products to to align to do what I wanted to do, that's becoming such a difficult task that you know um, having a single interface or having a familiar interface would actually help in that. So maybe you can talk a little about use that UI to go into the public cloud or into the hybrid cloud as well to make you know that experience easier as well. I'll talk, I'll talk about a couple of things. One, um, you know, whenever there's a proliferation of technologies and you're trying to glue it together, I mean, single pane of glass is one thing that people talk about. I think that's not the most important thing. I mean, obviously it's a requirement, it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient one. To make it sufficient, uh, you also have to bring in opinion into the design. And opinion is where um, we are taking some decisions for the customer where you know the customer wouldn't care about learning about those things. And that's where Nutanix will come in and through our best practices, we put our opinion in the design of the product mm -hmm. so that the number of decision points for the customer is minimized. And that's how you basically start consuming this diversity out there. At the end of the day, for the business, the only two things matter, the business logic and business data. Infrastructure is sitting in the middle, it's just like a necessary evil. So. You know, if we can hide it and make it seamless, you know, customers are really happy about it. Yeah, I wonder, can you talk about the, the feedback loop you have with customers? Things are changing very fast. Uh, you know, it, it, it's hard for anybody to keep up. Uh, you know, this week even, you know, Nutanix has, has a lot of announcements that I'm sure will take people a lot of time to there. How do you get the feedback loop to customers to make sure uh, you, you're, you're, they're getting what they need from, uh, to understand your products and, and you're understanding where they are in their journey and, uh, you know, mature the product line? Yeah. 
I mean, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, channels. We have, we just had a customer advisory board yesterday. You know, we invite customers and have a really deep, intimate conversation and frank conversation. You know, <laughs> what's working for you, what's not working. Uh, we have our engineering team on Slack channels and WhatsApp channels with our customers, especially the customers who are really, you know, they complain about a product and they have opinions of, you know, they, so we just try to short circuit this thing and it's all about empathy, so getting our team know, know yeah, the customers better. Just actually, yeah, Rajiv, I definitely want your opinion, but just feedback, yeah. actually, I, I talked to a few customers and they said, I don't know how Nutanix does it, but for a company their size, I feel like I get personal attention and touch points. So, congratulations, it's good to yeah, hear how that happens. Yeah, obviously feedback is important. So. Some, some of the stuff you saw today is a direct result of the feedback. The grouping of products into core essentials and enterprise kind of also reflects the customer journey. A lot of customers start with us. Go with the core. Once they get used to that, get the essentials products, build a true private cloud and only then they start looking at multi-cloud. So, right products for the right customer, it's something that we are taking very, very seriously at this point. So, so I want to dive into that, you know, right product, right customer. So one of the announcements you made is Carbon, at uh, Kubernetes as a, as a managed platform. So, what customers do you, do you service with that product? How do you go into customers like that, and how do you help them? Yeah, uh, good. Uh, See, yeah, Kubernetes is uh, one of the most fastest growing uh, technologies in the IT space uh, that we have seen in the in the recent years. And um, a lot of our customers, I would say, especially this year we have seen, they have developers using containers, right? And they are at a point where they're trying to decide, how can I put it in production? Now, production has uh, many requirements there. Um, Carbon is being used by our customers who are trying to see how they'll put uh, containers into production and what we are doing with Carbon is um, we're providing native Kubernetes APIs as is there in open source, but we're solving the hard problems of upgrades, scale out, high availability, troubleshooting, you know, these mundane things that you know usually people don't want to do and that's where we come in and help. Um, so I've seen customers use our storage volumes for even databases containerized to stateless things. It's all across the board. But still early years, I mean, for um, this kind of ecosystem. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, headed into, you know, it's going to be the future. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I found really interesting to watch is over the last two decades, we've talked about intelligence and automation and infrastructure, but really things are happening fast now. When you talk about you know, whether you're AI or ML, there's really things that are creating some intelligence that it's not like, oh, I created some script and it does some thing, but you know, it's working well. I, I know there's a number of places that that fits into your portfolio. Uh, maybe maybe, maybe we're deep, Prism X Play seemed to get some good some resonance and cheers from the audience yeah. because maybe they've all played with you know, the you know, if TTT. You right. know, if the, yeah. uh, so uh, start from there and uh, how do you think about the AI and ML space with Yeah, so we, we look at uh, you know, computing evolving from manual, mostly manual in the past, to more automated, but really you want to get to this autonomous computing that, that Sunil talked about. So you know, think of it as, you know, cars used to be really difficult to drive in the past. It used to require knowing how the carburetors work and cleaning them out once in a while, to the point where maybe 15 years ago, pretty much didn't know anything about the internals of a car, but you could drive it, it was reliable, it would work. Which is probably where we are today in IT. But the real goal is to get to that autonomous computing, the self-driving cars that Tesla and Google and others are trying to develop, where you don't even have to be paying attention and the car will just drive itself, right? Yeah. IFTTT and the X-Play stuff that we have is a step in that direction, it's obviously very early but it's the beginning of a journey where you can then start taking feedback loops, learning what works, modeling that out, and extending capabilities on your own. And that is something we'll be looking at over the next few years. And you know, it's uh, something where I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's not cute and that's why it needs to be done. It's actually required. Um, you know, if you look at Moore's law, it applies to machines. So every year you'll have double the number of cores and you know, the same dollar can buy more look at humans, that's not true. I mean, every year they're only getting more expensive. In fact, a lot of our customers here say talent is scarce. So, just by that definition, you see machines are growing and the people who manage the machines are shrinking or, you know, static. 
So you have to put in a layer of machine which is smart in the in the between in between of the human and the large pharma machines and that if you don't do it, there is no data center, so it's uh, inevitable, and you'll see this happen more and more. So that kind of sounds like you're you know, positioning your portfolio in a way that you enable the IT ops people to not care about infrastructure as much anymore, but help you know, the, their employer, their customer, do other stuff. So how does your portfolio relate to the freeing up of time for those employees, for those IT ops uh, people? Um, some of it is, uh, just goes back to the core design principle. I would, I would go to the basic, you know, how do we how do we start as a company? We were looking at storage and there were dual controller, A and B. A dies, B is running, but guess what? I'm worried that B will also die, it's the same age, so I have to run to fix A. Run to fix A is my weekend and the night wasted. If I had N, one dies, fine, I mean, it's a capacity problem. So that goes to the core, like how do we design things that are scale out and web scale we talked about. So everything that we do, including now Prism Central is scale out, I don't have to rush to go fix things. Hardware will always fail, right? And, and that's, you know, it permeates in the entire organization in terms of how we design things. Um, and then on top of that, you can add automation and machine intelligence and all that, but fundamentally it goes to engineering. Um. When, when you talk about, uh, we, we talked about earlier in, in the discussion, uh, kind of the rewrite uh, that, that went on for emerging applications and emerging technologies. Uh, I guess, what, what's exciting you these days? You know, you know uh, the, the industry as a whole, containers, you know, we looked at you know, flash technology, containerization. Uh, you know, I, I looked at Nutanix when it first came out as was you know, some of these waves coming together, hyperscale and software defined yeah. and flash all kind of were, were the perfect storm for the original generation. What, what, are, what are those next waves coming together uh, that, that you think will uh, you know, have a massive impact on the industry? Yeah, a lot of innovation going on on every layer of the stack. I mean, we start with the hardware. Uh, it's been coming for a while, but it's almost here now. The whole concept of having persistent memory. Yeah. Um, essentially, dim slots having memory that can persist across reboots and being byte addressable. So this is a big difference for the storage market, right? We've always had block addressable storage, but it becomes byte addressable. Paradigms of computing will change, algorithms will change, uh, how we write programs will change. So there's a whole big wave coming, and getting pre prepared for that was very important for yeah, us. Yeah, and, and if I, I could drill into that a little bit, because you know, when, I, when I thought about, you know, before it was, I, I had you know, my, my pool of storage, and my pool of compute, uh -huh. and I had my networking, and I thought, well, you know, what, what your solution is, I just have a pool of infrastructure. But I need specific data in specific places and latency is really important. You know, Amazon just announced, you know, a new compute instance with 100 gigabit networking for, you know, the same type of application we're talking about, HANA and persistent memory and the like. Yeah. Um, so, do we not think of it as a pool anymore? It's, I hear, you know, metadata and data are going to get more localized. So, how should we think of your infrastructure going forward? You should think of it as a pool. Yeah. We should worry about making it all, all, all work well, and that's, that, that is essentially our job. Um, if we can succeed at that, then uh, you would never have to think about it as, well, this particular you know, storage is allocated to this particular uh, application at this current time. It's up to us to make that happen as applications are running. Um, so from your point of view, it should be a pool. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, another thing that's happening in um, IT, or in, in, the, in the space of um, uh, compute, is the upper limit of this pool is being hidden, right? So for example, in the old days, there was disk, then there was a virtual disk, but it had a capacity and you would format it. When you look at S3, it doesn't have a capacity, you don't format it. That's what's, and, and that's more to application design. When you don't think about the capacity of the pool that you're using, that's the direction where we need to go and hide all this, right? You know, so just in time purchase of the next hardware that you need to get, but the developer does not see the upper limit. Well, Rajiv and Biddy, thank you so much for sharing all that updates. Congrats on all the progress and look forward to uh, what, what you're going to bring on down the, down the road. Thanks, Stu. Thanks, thank thank you. For you, Piscar, I'm Stu Miniman. Lots more coverage here at Nutanix.next London 2018. Thanks for watching. <laughs>